بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome everyone to Project Yahya podcast This week, alhamdulillah, we have with us our respected brother and uh, coach, Brother Fahim Farooq. Uh, welcome to the podcast. <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's an honor to be here. Barakallahu yeah. fikum. Exactly. Welcome, Brother Fahim. Uh, brother Fahim Farooq has a background in nutrition and exercise science and is currently pursuing studies in psychology and Islamic philosophy. He has also founded a coaching practice and movement known famously as the Green Pill. The Green Pill is a holistic approach to masculine development through strength training, mixed martial arts, MMA, nutrition, addiction recovery and discipline, wife vetting and marital success, foundational Islamic knowledge and prophetic love, as well as social skills, uh, coaching programs that have been evolving for the past 10 years. Um, Brother Fahim is also the founder of Majesty and Beauty, a platform for traditional scholars seeking to confront modernist inversions challenging our aqidah and fiqh by articulating the truth and balance found in Islam. He has previously discussed modern men's issues on a variety of podcasts, such as with uh, Brother Hamza Sources of Sapiens Institute. When available, Fahim mentors youth in his local Muslim community through the BDKW Welfare Foundation. Uh, being one of those at the forefront of modern day ideological or we can say cultural wars, we hope to inshallah engage our guest on issues at the intersection of Islam's clash with modern day movements and influences. You know, there's a hadith of Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu in which he narrates that Khatta Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam khattan biyadihi thumma qal hadha sabirullahi mustaqima. That Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, once he drew a line and he said to the Sahaba, he drew it in the sand, and he said to them that Hada Sabirullahi Mustaqima, that this is the straight path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he drew lines, you know, branching out from that straight line. Thummaqal he said, Hadihis subul laysa minha sabilun illa alayhi shaytanun yadu ilayhi. That these are other paths and there's not a single path from them except that there's a shaitan sitting there calling people towards it. ثم قراء, then the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, he recited وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ That verily this is the straight path, so follow it. وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلَ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ And do not follow these other paths. فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ You will be divided. From this path, or you will divert from this straight path. In this narration, we learn that any path leading away from what Islam has laid down is a path to failure. <clears throat> now, every day, new avenues leading away from the Islamic path open up. Hence, it is imperative we understand what the Islamic path is and what it diverges and what diverges from it. Our esteemed guest today will inshallah discuss with us some of the prominent divergent paths Muslims and really a lot of society is veering towards these days along with offering solutions from his long experience dealing with those that have treaded down those paths. And inshallah before we do that I would ask uh, Hafiz Musab if he has anything inshallah to add before we uh, give the floor to our guest inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan, uh, Sheikh Asadullah, for the uh, beautiful introduction of our guest. I would also like to extend a warm welcome uh, and uh, turn it back to you, uh, Mawlana Asadullah. And just before that, uh, just a reminder, uh, give this video a thumbs up and uh, subscribe, inshallah, so that you continue to get uh, information on what we're doing. So I guess I can open up the with the first question, and it's really related to kind of what it is that um you do you know uh, you we said in the beginning in the intro as well that you coach men in masculine development and this seems kind of like a new idea or something that's kind of um you, we didn't really really hear a lot about you know helping men being more men or masculine you know previously yes there was in the past uh, there was other has always been a tradition in islam of mentorship 
uh, being with a sheikh, being with someone that can guide you spiritually, especially uh, more you know prominently. And I know that's also what you guys focus on as well. But the question is that what is driving or what is what are the core uh, causes that drive this need for now helping men uh, when it comes to masculinity, helping them being men? This would be something that would be considered strange in more traditional societies, but it's coming more common now and it's a need actually. So what do you think or what would you say is what is driving the need for that? Allahumma salli ala sayyidina Muhammad Allahumma salli ala sayyidina Muhammad Allahumma salli ala sayyidina Muhammad Bismillah walhamdulillah was salatu was salam ala rasulillah amma abad <clears throat> First and foremost once again jazakum allahu khairan for having me it's an honor I've been looking for an initiative such as what you yourselves have established for quite some time where we see traditional sunni ulama and and students of knowledge coming to the forefront of these issues because for quite some time i noticed that authentically and grounded sunni voices were missing in this sphere we saw a lot of salafi or salafi adjacent da'is and da'wah institutions they were they were on the the move you know dealing with uh western the western hemisphere and uh the anglosphere uh confronting uh the more non-Muslim intelligentsia class, right? Like going into debates with atheists and even going to debates with feminists. But for a long time, <clears throat> people have been craving to see uh, the Sunni ulama and students of knowledge meet these issues head on. So Alhamdulillah, I'm honored to be yeah, with you. I think that's an important point. Mashallah, a lot of the Salafi brothers nowadays, they've taken that initiative and they've taken it uh, really far ahead. And, you know, a lot of our other traditional ulama, Sunni scholars and ulama, they've kind of uh, remained or retained this grassroots, you know, kind of at the masajid and things like that. Right. And they've uh, left, uh, the, you know, the old tradition of debating with and, you know, taking head on the challenge. And I'm not saying they're not doing it, but it seems like, you know, we've, we've started to become lazier in that sense or uh, not as right. connected so that's that's an right. important point that uh, you know and that's actually one of uh, that was actually one of our purposes as well how we can get traditional ulama uh, to the forefront on these uh intellectual issues and give a platform uh to those people uh the idea was not just that how you know one or two people can um can do this but how we can uh find those kind kinds of like uncut gems or those hidden gems rather and uh, and bring them to the forefront and mashallah, you know, uh, subhanAllah, it's, you find a lot of the, the traditional, the true, sincere traditional ulama, you'll really ha you will really have to work hard to convince them, you know. Uh, Get on a podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to them, it's so, alhamdulillah, you know, we make dua that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept and make this uh, a force Ameen. for good. Inshallah. Ameen. Ameen. <clears throat> and the interesting thing is, while the format was certainly different because it was a different age, a hundred years ago, it was not always like this where, you know, we, we not to say hid behind, but lagged behind the Salafi class. We had legends, luminaries like Sheikh al-Islam, Mustafa Sabri, rahimahullah, who is my hero, truly a hero. Uh, I, I've been reading his recently translated book, Qawli Fil Mara, uh, which translates to roughly views on womanhood or my statement on, on women. And this was translated just recently um, by two brothers, young brothers. They were undertaking this as a project. And I actually wept like when I was just reading his biography in, in the first few pages because what he went through mm. at the demise of the Uthmani Sultanate, the Ottomans, you know, right at the end of its life, uh, reading what he went through, it, it just moved me to tears. Like his courage, his intellectual fortitude, his love and reverence for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and tawakkul upon Allah azza wa jal in the face of just traitors left, right and center who had adopted <clears throat> the Europe European frame of reference, the, the, the Kufar's frame of reference. And he single-handedly stood up against so many of them while he, his scholarly brothers were being arrested or, or, or killed in front of him. And he challenged the Orientalists of his time and, and the pioneering Muslim feminists of his time and, and reformists of his time. 
and I, you know, I, I knew of him very loosely before, but until recently, I didn't actually know of these details and the extent to which he engaged so many of the issues that we're seeing in far more, you know, sinister forms today. Mm. And I realized that someone like him is more relevant to our times than we can possibly imagine. And we really need to reconnect because he was the last great Sheikh al-Islam of the, of the Ottomans. He was a true Sunni uh, master of Kalam. He was a mutaqallim. And he was he was a sage. And so I realized that like it's not that we've always been lagging behind. We've had our our masters, our our revivers and renewers. We just have lost touch with them today. Often, like the, the, the Sunni lay class has lost. It also touch points with them to today. their foresightedness. I know a lot of times we read the works of our previous scholars and ulama and and mashaykh, and we see that they address things that seem so pertinent to today. You know, where right. a lot of people are thinking that our scholars have nothing to say about what's what we're dealing with. But then when you open their books and you really uh, look into where where their mind was, what they were thinking, what they foretold of almost, you know, it's almost prophetic. And <laughs> this is that's a sad thing, you know, when people see like, uh, when people think of Ulama, they just think of the Imams in the Masajid, right? And especially back home. So what they think is that, uh, you know, this is like, they have nothing to offer. But subhanAllah, if you, uh, you know, if you look at the, the, the books of ulama, it's, if, if you have, um, you know, mutala of, uh, of those, well, you're going to be like, is there any issue that they didn't think of? Yeah. You know, is there like a single issue that, that uh, you know, that passed them by that they didn't forget, think about, write about, uh, pro think about, process, and uh, write about? So subhanAllah, right. like right. what you're saying is, is very true that the issues of today are, uh, already found in the past in the writings of our ulama, and uh, in a way, we're always like reliving the past, right? Because history always repeats itself. So, uh, what, yeah. there's going to be minor uh, micro differences, but in a macro sense, there's always like repetition. Um, so, yes. uh, your your history is like a beautiful place to you know to draw lessons. The university, yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. And if you've seen so many like, stories in the Quran where we are we're explicitly told to reflect on the nations that came before us that they are signs for us including the destruction of those nations and that we should pay heed so that we don't mm. follow them in those footsteps that led to their destruction yeah that's one of the angles of even mentioning these stories of the previous nations in the quran that you can learn from the past i mean that's a big lesson right. and i think it also kind of um, brings up the idea or the question in our minds is that are we what are we what are we warning our or what are we doing in terms of preparing for the future onslaughts that are going to come those ulama in their time they were writing about things that we're dealing with now uh, alhamdulillah a lot of us are dealing with what we're dealing with now but are we really preparing something for the future generations kind of that foresightedness may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that foresightedness to Ameen. Do something I mean, that can help the generations coming in the future. And also speaking, Shalom, speaking of the past, uh, going back to Monana Asudla's question, like he mentioned that, um, you know, in the past, you wouldn't uh, commonly see something like, you know, uh, coaching men, right? So what makes the right. present a bit different than the, uh, than the past? Because we do have to acknowledge uh, that the present today is going to be a bit different just because of the technological advances that the rapid technological advances we've seen in the last 15 20 30 years right and even more of course but uh, especially with the smartphone and how that has changed the data revolution how it's changed the world so um <clears throat> and uh, even, even just the moral decay even not even the yeah. technological Absolutely. Moral decay. Yeah. if yeah. you could go ahead and continue sorry we kind of uh no, so it's all good. Barakallahu for asking such a pointed question and for redirecting us back to the question. As for the question, it's very important because a lot of people who are literally swimming in a in a sea of emasculation, the the perversion, the distortion, and utterly uh, uh, de utter de deformation of manhood, them themselves don't recognize what is going on in their surroundings. They might be head deep in emasculation themselves without recognizing it. If we look at examples within like the half a century ago, about half a century ago, a little bit more in the, in the 60s or so, such as uh, Malcolm X, we find that before he left 
the so-called nation of Islam and became a Sunni, he was actually involved in teaching what's, what's no, what was known as husbandry classes. And husbandry mm -hmm. classes uh, were basically classes where he was teaching black men about masculinity and how to be formed masculine men who were effectively stewards of the family, the family that was centered around God. And there's a picture, I think it, it is by the Chicago University Press or another university, maybe Yale. Um, but if you look at if you look up Malcolm X teaching husbandry on Google, you'll find it. He has uh, on his uh, chalkboard uh, a lesson plan, basically laying out his schema of the natural order and a hierarchy between God, man, woman, child. And he very clearly linked man as the head of the family. And the question I started to to ask was, what did he know? What did he know at that time that made him realize that this was so pertinent? And this was in the 60s. Obviously, he had seen his community go through all sorts of economic, political, spiritual, and social breakdown through external colonizing forces. This had had, had happened over centuries, and so he recognized that the black family was fundamentally broken. And it required intervention to reform its foundations and the foundations he identified as reconnecting with God and rediscovering and retraining men to be effective, masculine heads of the family. And so mm. when we look at that situation, we can now draw lessons for why a lot of other communities of men and boys require similar styles of intervention. Why? Because emasculation has become a systemic problem. It occurs politically. It occurs uh, legally. It occurs through the education system. It even occurs on a biochemical level through hygiene <laughs> products full of uh, testosterone inhibitors. And mm. so for over the last century, we see that, for example, in the West, the notion of patriarchy, of, of the father and the husband being the head of the household and lineage being traced through both. Uh, namely the father, of course, uh, has been completely inverted, right? The, the legal system has reflected these changes. Um, how, how women are viewed as legal agents has shifted radically. For instance, you don't need your father's permission to marry in the West. You don't, you're not, you don't refer to your husband as your wadi. I mean, there's no court in the Western world or across Europe that sees the, 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 the uh, fa uh, father, let alone the husband, as a woman's guardian. Mm -hmm. And yet in the Muslim legal code, we know that it's very, very clear that the father and or the husband, etc., have a guardianship role. So given the nature of these changes, we have seen likewise cultural shifts that accompany these changes. When you have these political and legal shifts, naturally they, they also show up in cultural attitudes that change. For instance, uh, how you raise your boys and girls. So you have entire generations of uh, boys that were raised in the West well before our time. We're talking in, in the sexual revolution age, the baby boomers who were mm. raised with completely different styles of parenting and ideals versus their grandfathers. And so that's going to reflect in how they act as males. What do they what do they think is their role as males? What do they think about having Haira versus pursuing free love, which is a concept that actually dates back hundreds of years ago to people like uh, Percy, Percy Shelley. Percy Shelley, his wife is, I, I believe, um, Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. And both of them, they were uh, active in their work like in the, in, in the 1800s. And they were both occultists. They were both people who rejected the idea of God, even the Christian God, but also our concept of Allah, our belief in Allah. And these individuals wrote about things like free love, love knowing no bounds, uh, involving yourself in polyamorous relationships, not polygynous, but polyamorous relationships, women themselves having multiple lovers in their day and age. And we saw that manifest in, in, into popular culture in the 60s, where everyone was taught you should just go around sleeping with as many women as you can or, or as many men as you can. You had the hippie movement and so on and so forth. And so naturally, this deformed masculinity. And 
the new form of masculinity that we've seen taken shape in the last few decades has been what's called postmodern masculinity, where the ideal of manhood is based on the feminist ideals of what should a, a male be. And ironically, they resemble a lot of what a traditional woman was expected to be. And what, it, what, what the feminists call toxic masculinity is ironically uh, glorified if a woman embodies those ideals. So if a woman acts a certain way that if a guy was to do that, he'd be called a toxic male. If a woman does that, she's strong and empowered, right? If she has a, a more dominant persona and is, 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 is uh, perceived as controlling the direction of her relationships and the males around her are, are more passive, she's seen as a an ideal woman to follow. If so I, could, if I could ask a question just on this one point. You know, sure. uh, nowadays you find a lot of females that, you know, they've done these studies where they would, they they actually are attracted more to the, what would you call a toxic male? You know what I'm saying? Uh, yes. Or, or yes. those traits, they're actually kind of driven towards the, you know, the, the man who's assertive and this and that. Uh, so what drives the, the, the imp the, what, what drives them towards trying to emasculate men, right? It would seem contradictory. Like if that's what they wanted to see in a man, why would they try to? Um, why would they? Why would a woman say one thing and want another? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't they done that all throughout? You know, civilization? <laughs> Subhanallah. Well, what's interesting is actually there's the forces behind that, and not just yes. women. I mean, like, and know, actually, and actually, uh, building on his question, like. How much of this do you think is top down or versus bottom up? Like, is this something which is being pushed from the top down? Are there like institutions and uh, uh, that are that are feeding this uh, into society? Or was this like a decay from the bottom, like a philosophical uh, decay <clears throat> or ideology that just spread naturally and organically? So, inshallah, I'll, I'll address both questions in order. Firstly, a lot of studies actually have shown that women who are on birth control lose sight of their natural instinct for a more masculine uh, partner or, or you know whether that's a boyfriend or a husband they the, the result is the same that on birth control they start to find themselves inhibited and unable to fully experience the level of attraction they naturally would for a traditionally masculine male Instead, and this is based on uh, a study or uh, yes some, okay yes so like they no and longer feel the attract, they no longer feel the need or the want for it, like a protect protective. Uh, it, it's it's still there to a degree, but it's it's highly suppressed. It's okay. highly suppressed. Interesting. And in, instead, they find themselves somewhat drawn to a more uh, a, 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 what you could call an emasculated caricature of of a male, but they're not truly satisfied with that. Which is why we see that the divorce rates are off the charts with the vast majority of divorces in the Western world and Europe being initiated by women. And that only goes up with their promotion at work, for instance. Mm. So why would they want to do this? Well, I think it's because they themselves have been so deeply conditioned and that their own femininity has likewise, just as men have been have been deformed from their fifth three inclinations, women have likewise been deformed from their fifth three inclinations. Their femininity has been deformed. And so because of this conditioning, they are taught from childhood onwards through the mass media, through schooling, and through lived models in their lives. For example, seeing their own fathers being emasculated, seeing how their, their mothers related to their fathers in demeaning ways, in domineering ways. Some of them seeing their fathers being kicked to the curb in divorce cases where things, that, things like the mother being caught in an affair didn't mm. win the father custody, and he still lost mm. everything. Right? These types of cases are, are very well known in uh, the U.S. and Canada and elsewhere. And so when they see these things, it's going to shape their perception of how are they supposed to relate to males? Mm. How are they themselves supposed to view males? Mm. And it's self-sabotaging because, as you mentioned, it doesn't actually serve their own fifth three needs. It doesn't bring a state of long-term contentment. And, uh, you know, in uh, in a way, like the best, the most effective way a person learns is through suhbah, right? So right. when <clears throat> when the suhbah that you've had Right, the model that you've had at home uh, is not an ideal model. Then, to some degree, you can only think uh, to the extent of the model that you've been shown at home. Yeah, Absolutely. personally, it kind of like goes back to the idea of being a product of your surroundings or environment. Yeah. Um, you did touch upon how it how it came about. 
So what are the effects of that? What are we seeing today in 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 front of our eyes? The effects of that emasculation, like if you can maybe share some incidents or some experiences that you had. I know you deal with a lot of men, right? And right. you hear a lot of you know situations and stories. Some and of them are, you, and you kind of think, oh man, that is you. You can see the connection of where where this started from or where it's going. Um, right. So inshallah, if you could share from your experience, also that would be inshallah. I open it first. So I do believe that initially these problems have a top-down origin. But over time, as, as, as there is a greater impact on society, there starts to be a bi-directional influence where bottom-up forces mm -hmm. start to work with those top-down mm -hmm. forces. Like when, when the top-down forces are successful enough at, at corrupting enough levels of society, now those corrupt levels also speed up the process. Basically when they hit like a critical mass. When they hit a critical mass, exactly. Mm -hmm. And one of the proofs of this is that some of the second wave feminists uh, <coughs> in, for example, France, like Simone de Beauvoir, she was complaining that the early suffragettes were struggling to get traction with the masses of women and the early suffragists were, were mainly like these privileged aristocratic women who had the, mm -hmm. the free time and luxury to sort of, you know, engage in all kinds of mental gymnastics, uh, pontificate about problems and also gravitate towards all kinds of you know, occultic practices, including witchcraft, including exploring uh, satanic uh, masonry their own husbands or the men in their lives were involved in that. And so these women were also involved in that, but the masses of, women, heard of that angle before I knew they were like, you know, trying to get more into the political sphere with, you know, women right. suffrage and voting and all that. But yeah. Um, and a lot of this is, is I, never heard of the dark, I mean, I know, I yeah. know was, they were involved in a lot of dark things, but wow. Right. Right. That. There's a, a book that's actually called the divine feminine uh, theosophy and the women's movement. And it's by joy Dixon. She's an academic, I think, based in British Columbia. Um, mm -hmm. This was this was a reflection of her work, and it revolves around this one pioneering uh, occult feminist named Helena Blavatsky. And if you look at their ideas, they're all very, very similar. Like you, the, the previous thinker I mentioned, Percy Shelley, his wife, Mary, Mary Shelley, the, the author of Frankenstein, they wrote, both of them wrote all kinds of occultic themes that went hand in hand with their, their vision of a feminist future. And a lot of what they wrote were effectively inversions of what Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam revealed oh, as goodness. good. What we what we believe to be good, they declared as evil. And what we declare as evil, or what we believe to be evil by the command of Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they declared as good. Inversion. Just like what we know of how the Dajjal will operate, how he will present good as evil and evil as good. His, his garden will be uh, the fire it's kind of like the deception with the you know equal you know equality which sounds like a good thing but then really right. in, 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 into it it's actually not what you know, it's actually not thought. right uh, you know a lot of these principles it's uh, they're they're labeled kind of deceptively it's uh, just right. like a mirage you know from far it looks very attractive but when you go you see there's nothing there absolutely and, uh, that's really what you see every day in uh western society anyone who's lived here worked here you've had personal interactions it's it's really very sad you know well it's yeah. just interesting we're moving on towards the end of times anyway and the the jail is kind of like the ultimate sort of uh exactly um, the ultimate manifestation example, of these manifestation of it so right. it would make right. sense that this is where it would be headed but carry on right. go ahead inshallah so you know and they wrote about things that were considered very taboo in their time for example uh incestuous relationships uh, being involved in, in an affair. So Mary Shelley was 17 and she got into an affair with her later husband. She, he was already married at the time. And so it wasn't like a situation of polygyny. It was, a, it was an affair and it reflected their ideas of what, what's called open love. You don't need to have any marriage. You can just fornicate, enjoy peace, love, the hippie call, the hippie man mantra. And they worship their desires just as Allah warns us of the, the followers of Iblis, that they worship their desires, the, the one who takes their own desires, their Lord. Mm. right? And, and so if you look at these types of, of, of patterns of thought, you see that they were adopted on a much softer level by the original Muslim reformers in Egypt, for example, those who infiltrated Al-Azhar. 
and who people like Sheikh Mustafa Sabri rahimahullah had to fight. And that included people like um, one of them, his name was Qasim Amin, I believe. Qasim Amin. And I was very amused to find that Qasim Amin, he was he was viewed as a reformist in his time by the traditional ulama. However, it, it's interesting to note that his ideas on women's education were more restrictive than today's modern uh, Taliban. And so he was making these little small incremental shifts towards what he viewed as liberation. And so like people who were considered re reformers in, in those times, if they if someone was to hold those beliefs today, would they'd still be seen as regressive. That's the irony, is that mm. the people who our shuyukh have to go up against, they're considered the reformers of that time. But by today's standards, they're still seen as regressive. So that can that gives you an understanding of how far we've strayed today. What the or norms even where are. the trajectory is going. Right. It's like, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's just considering from that time till now how far along they've come. Right. I can only imagine from now going forward, it really reflects the hadith that we have regarding the end times and what where humanity will actually get to. Very uh, Subhanallah. interesting, yeah. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. It's very frightening. Undoubtedly, yeah, it's very frightening. And, and you generation. mentioned uh, a lot of these women, you know, I think it was uh, John Stuart Mill's wife, Harriet uh, Mill. Well, she was also involved in some of course, sort of a yes. she was married to someone else, actually. And she was right. uh, with him. And then she wrote the enfranchisement of women. Subhanallah. And Subhanallah. And so their, their personal lives, you know, you can see in their personal lives, the level of fahisha that yeah. reflects what they really believe is good. And that's become popular culture now. And, you know, it's no surprise that if you look at the lives of a lot of politicians today and statesmen and, and you know, the, the highest um, the highest corporate stakeholders, you'll notice that a lot of them likewise gravitate towards very satanic ways of living, mm. uh, outright rituals that is very well known, has been documented that they find themselves involved in. And you can see a lot of them have had these, these types of connections well before they became, you know, middle-aged, even in university, in a lot of the fraternities, um, like at Yale like, or Princeton or Yale, which one, one of the two, they have the skulls and bones fraternity. And they were known for all kinds of satanic practices that people who were, you know, the children of presidents, the children of multimillionaires, the children of politicians, etc., were involved in. And so this reminded me of something that a, a sheikh, uh, I can't remember his name. The last part of his name is Al Hanbali. He he is based in in uh, Turkey, and he wrote the foreword of the translation of this book that was originally by Sheikh Mustafa Sabri. <clears throat> he actually mentioned that when he dug into a lot of Sheikh Sabri's works and and looked into the people he was addressing, the the reformers that he was addressing, he found horrifyingly but predictably that they were people who had ties to Freemasonry. They were people who like had tied secret to societies and things secret like that. societies and these types of organizations. And if you look at some of the letters uh, by Sultan Abdul Hamid II, rahimahullah, well, perhaps the last great, truly autonomous Ottoman Sultan, he mentions the, the Freemasons by name and mentions them as enemies who are trying to infiltrate. So it's like this is not a conspiracy. These are these are the, the heads of state directly acknowledging their existence and their influence. And in that sense, I think, you know, there was a top down influence. And then eventually hit a critical mass, and you have generations upon generations of disastrous results. I think maybe if some of these reformists saw what their hands were going to reap in 2024, what their great grandchildren were going to be involved in, maybe some of them would have been horrified. That how could I, oh man, this is what I this is what I've produced. produced I, I think you know, do you think someone, that they knew? Do, do you think that they were honestly thinking that I'm just I'm reforming here, or do you think that maybe they um well it'd be hard to say i guess you know to to say that um uh, it was malicious or did they actually see themselves as reforming problems that were existent in society or within you know problems that they they saw as problems within the religious community right i think i think there were a, a mix of both mm -hmm. types of actors you know you may have had people who were convinced that they were doing the right thing and then you had people who were probably subverting Islam from the inside and the Muslim mm -hmm. community from the inside as their goal. They were they were probably aware that their their true allegiance was to Iblis. 
Yeah, I guess the damage from both would be the same. And, yeah. and one, you know, yeah. one interesting thing is that um, the West, when they enacted these changes, they were not uh, seeing the effect live, right? Like it was yet to come. But the Muslims, they're undergoing this. And, you know, I think it's a point of debate. Like maybe in the West, it could have been, you know, bottom up, top down. But for the Muslim world, it's definitely like top down. It's being pushed from the Absolutely. West, right? Yes. But but the interesting okay. thing is that for, for the Muslim world, uh, they're living in a time when the effect uh, or the logical conclusion of this ideology is uh, is currently being lived. So they can see it, yet they're still kind of, you know, going down that uh, that route. They live in the paradigm. Yeah, they live in the paradigm. Yeah, they're the paradigm. they're seeing the effects. And, you know, you can still make an excuse maybe for the ones that are living in the Muslim world to some degree that, okay, they're not interacting with those non-Muslims every day. Um, even though you cannot make an excuse, but maybe more of an excuse than the Muslims living in the West. You know, right. they're living right. in the West and they're seeing live every day the the the, the harmful effects of this. And uh, yet they still continue. Uh, so what is your, you know, your thought of the Muslim uh, feminism phenomenon? So I see I see it as on a spectrum and there are loosely two main kinds. The first is easier to spot and easier to address. And the second one is more nefarious because it is more closeted. And interestingly, mm. Sheikh Sabri, he, he also viewed it in this term, in these terms. That namely, you have those who are explicitly feminist and they are explicitly at war with Islam and, and the Muslims. They, mm. they are ideological oppo opponents and they make it clear that they are. And then the second are those who operate from within the Muslim communities and they wear the garb and the mask of being a Muslim, a Muslim ally, or at worst, a Muslim scholar. Like today's uh, celebrity imams, the, the so-called sheikhs and ustadas, who you know you can see all over YouTube, all over Instagram, and also the the relationship coaches, the so-called relationship coaches who are popping up and and engaging way out of their lanes, giving marriage counselors and whatnot. Yeah, right. And these two kinds have both done their damage, but I think that. The, the latter, those who are closeted feminists who pretend that they are actually representing Islam, but who are actually trying to distort it from the inside out, I think they're more dangerous mm -hmm. because they, they they disarm people's guards. And they, I think it's also because they understand exactly what the objective is. Yes. Uh, and I think this would be probably a good point. Uh, we get this question a lot that why can't I just be like a Muslim feminist? You know, a lot of Muslim girls, especially in high yeah. school and in college, they'll have this yeah. thing like, I just want, you know, women's rights i want to fight for women that makes me a feminist maybe and, I and this on, kind of you know, a feminist that makes you a muslim and, and this kind and this kind of user profile or this kind of profile uh would you be comfortable making a third type of class where you have like a sincere muslim right like you have a sincere muslim or a sincere muslima and uh, they're just misled by the other two categories right yeah. and if yes. they get the you know they get the because i i really think that the majority of the ummah inshallah we have good hope for the ummah right we have inshallah. so uh the majority of them inshallah are like that you know they're just misled and if they get misled long enough you know then sometimes they fall into the other uh, other two categories but uh you know i think this third differentiation uh is important because most of our uh you know muslim brothers and sisters if they inshallah get the correct knowledge inshallah we have hope from allah that they will uh, correct their, their uh, understanding yeah and i think that's a very important a distinction because this third category is more of someone who reflects more of someone who's a lay person they don't have an active hand yeah. uh, in leadership capacities or or even posturing mm -hmm. as a leader um and it's it, it, the lines get blurred because some of those people if they know how to play the algorithm well and they have at least some base marketing knowledge they can even though they're even though they are lay people in terms of their their knowledge they are elevated to the level of community leadership mm. and then they act as such. So I would still mm. I would still uh, distinguish between someone who has that level of influence and someone who's just naive. And yes. as you said, is, a, is just receiving conditioning. They're just growing up, receiving conditioning, and they don't understand why they're, they're not actively behavior. conditioning others. Right. Yeah, they're just so. perpetuating whatever society is teaching them. And society mm -hmm. becomes the, the the biggest impetus the biggest mechanism through which they become feminists right and it's to not, the point of uh, the the compatibility is can islam even be compatible with feminism if you 
if you could maybe shed uh, sure. or spare a few words on that, because sure. I know this question sure. comes a lot, like, why can't I be a Muslim yeah. feminist, you know? <laughs> and, the, and, and the answer is absolutely not. Yeah. And the reason for why is because it is a, a contradiction in terms. If we look at what is feminism at its very core, putting aside the academic mumbo jumbo, all the different schools, whether we're talking about Marxist feminism, where we're talking about liberal feminism, or if we're talking about radical feminism, it doesn't matter. They may have different interpretations of what they consider the problem of class and gender and how they intersect, or even race, how that intersects with. And nowadays, I think it's intersectional feminism. Right, intersectional mm -hmm. feminism. Feminism is one. They might have different ideas of what what is the exact nature of w modern women's, and even or rather the historical nature of the problem of, of women past present and future they might have a different uh, different set of interpretations of you know what what role do men play in this in these problems but at their heart all of them are united on one front and that is they are vehemently opposed to any concept or model of male authority if it's your father or your husband it doesn't matter they are opposed to the idea that any man has any level of authority over any woman such that he can actually put any restriction on her own autonomy. And so any single school of feminism can agree on that point, and they will therefore reject the entire fabric of marriage in Islam. Even if we argue with them that, look, this is delegated by Allah, he is the ultimate authority, to them, that doesn't cut it. Mm -hmm. So then so, what do you say about, uh, let's like hyper-individuality. Uh, hyper-individuality. You have a lot of Muslim women who will say that, okay, the only reason a lot of women, uh, a lot of Muslim women become uh, feminists is because of the, uh, because of the oppression that they endure at the, at the hands of maybe uh, traditional Muslims. Like, let's say she's in her uh, home and then her in-laws are giving her trouble. And this kind of situation can actually occur and it does occur, right? Um, so uh, that's why, you know, we have to fight for these women and uh, we're just really just trying to get their rights. Um, so what would you say uh, to that kind of objection? I would say we have to be clear on definitions. If a woman is being mistreated according to the Sharia, then, that, then we can qualify that as genuine oppression. But if yeah. she is being mistreated only by the terms and conditions of a liberal morality, but not according to the Sharia, then we don't even agree that there is a problem other than her, her understanding. Right, because today a lot of women will consider shari parameters as oppressive because they've been so conditioned to see the the, the sharia and the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, as inherently oppressive because of their liberal conditioning. So if she can qualify and if we can qualify through our investigation that there is actually a problem in how the woman is being treated, then for sure we can we can now investigate how uh, can we intervene, if at all, and apply islamically grounded solutions right but if she doesn't even agree with the terms and definitions that a traditional muslim is supposed to hold then we have a bigger problem and so this is one of the one of the the hurdles that we need to overcome and the second one is while it's true that how men act as husbands and fathers can make it easier or harder for feminist ideas to infiltrate the family, infiltrate how women in the family think. It's not the macro cause. Why? Because you had cases all throughout human history where men may have been uh, abusive to women in certain contexts. They didn't become feminists. Why? Because there was no such thing as, as feminism. And therefore, the reason they're becoming feminists today is because it's been made available by society. It's been, it's been made a thing by society that has become hegemonic popular, institutional, right? In the past, you know, if we look at the history of humanity, there were far harsher circumstances in all parts of the world, but you didn't have feminism, right? You had you had acts of injustice, but you didn't have recourses or reactions into what we see as feminism today because it wasn't even available. It wasn't even a thing. And then likewise, you have the average person identifying with feminist thinking, even when there's no you know, clear, uh, you know, stereotypical concept of, of oppression going on. Like you have like a wife beating, you know, impulsive father. None of that is the case. If anything, you have a, an overly permissive father 
sending his daughter off to secular education in, in, in university, and she's just being indoctrinated. And so mm -hmm. these are the two contentions I would give back to someone who says, hey, this is the reason why our sisters are becoming feminist. I think you uh, kind of hit it, hit the nail on the head. It's a, uh, you know, people reading the symptoms and reading them wrong, seeing something as oppressive when it's not oppressive, it's just Sharia. And they're, you know, trying to uh, fight it. And their natural recourse would be to feminism. Whereas right. if it's a real actual problem, a real symptom, then Islam provides the answer. They don't need to go to feminism. They can so simply work from within the Islamic framework. Islam has a framework within uh, to solve those kinds of uh, issues. And it's kind of like a Muslim vegan, you know, like a Muslim vegan who views yeah. like, you know, he sees yeah. an, an, uh, all these animals being uh, slaughtered on Eid. And then he feels that this is oppression, right? And uh, he feels this is oppression. And he's like, now, obviously, you're not going to be able to work within the Islamic framework to solve that. Because in Islam, that's not viewed as something wrong. So right. first, you have to figure out what is right and wrong, right? Right. Uh, so uh, naturally, if you view something as wrong, which Islam does not view as wrong, then you're going to have a very difficult time. You're going to have to resort to a foreign ideology, right? Absolutely. And in Absolutely. reality, when there's two things like this that cannot reconcile, uh, you know, it actually puts the iman of a person in danger. Uh, but you know, let's say that there is like let's let's take the devil's advocate situation a bit further and say that okay. A person, uh, a woman says, or, or or somebody says that, okay, uh, there are many situations of oppression that even the Sharia views as oppression, but we don't find the conservative Muslims, the cultural Muslims, willing to uh, to even recognize this as oppression, much less to fight it. So in that situation, uh, what should they do when a woman is just she feels trapped and she doesn't feel like she has any other refuge uh, other than this, you know, these women, uh, or you know, other than this kind of ideology? where she's, you know, actually going through this. Those situations are, they're gut-wrenching. And I've had to deal with them personally in my extended family, in my community, and for, in, in the lives of people who are very close to me. And I realized that had I not personally intervened, they would have had no one to vouch for them and to protect them, right? And oh. as a man, mm -hmm. I felt a calling to do so. And so it is a responsibility on men to do so in those situations. Mm -hmm. You have to you. this is part of a rojula manhood, that you, you are the one who is willing to figuratively get ugly so a woman doesn't have to. SubhanAllah. Right? Right? You are the I one who is willing good, to get uh, ugly in the forefront so a woman doesn't have to. I think that's a good uh, point that we can uh, take it to the next topic. Now, you talk about men uh, standing up and being responsible. Uh, and that gets us to the question about green pill. Maybe if you could talk, I know we've, our discussion has been going on uh, close to an hour. So I want you to talk a little bit about green pill uh, itself, what it means, how it's applied, how is, what is the strategy and what is the sort of objective? I know you spoke about masculinity. We've talked about it here now for some time, but, you know, basically to put it in a nutshell for everyone and, um, uh, kind of and, and also how it's different from you know you, you named pill. it green pill so it's very close to red pill yeah. so you have uh feminism you have red pill so where does green pill you know fall in subhanallah on Great question. is it even a spectrum <laughs> so i would say that to build off of what ustad mustafa azam mentioned in your previous interview he's someone who i take as a mentor and as a teacher he laid out the rational uh, empirical and legal judgments that we use to classify knowledge and uh, how we how we cater how we categorize our thought and how and our actions. And so, if we look at the rational, empirical, and legal judgments, we have a framework for uh, determining what extra Islamic uh, movement ideology, practice, science, you name it, is compatible with Islam and at what level. For example, there are empirical observations that are made in science that are often compatible and we, we would actually re refer to them to, to draw legal judgments. Maybe maybe you go to you go to seek out a fatwa and the fatwa is contingent or dependent upon, some empirical facts that a scientist or a doctor has to verify before the the mufti can pass a verdict 
if it's harmful, for example, he needs to know, okay, is there proof that this is harmful before I pass a ruling on it? So we can rely on people who are experts in that, in, in that capacity of, of, of empirically gathering data to pass an empirical judgment. And then we can use that knowledge and integrate it with Islamic knowledge, which would include the legal judgments and the rational judgments. And then we can come to a conclusion that is the fatwa. And that fatwa would be part and parcel of our, our deen. And in this sense, we haven't done anything haram. We haven't done anything incompatible with Islam. But the question is, is a person doing that with their work, right? Are, are they being meticulous and being careful to ensure that that's what they're doing? Or are they in some way, shape or form stepping outside the bounds of the Sharia? And so we see that feminism does that as, in the ways that I've explained. Uh, you look at all the popular culture manifestations of it. You know, Muslim Girl Magazine, it's full of fahisha, promotes LGBTQ. We, you look at the founders of the, the Women's March that happened in Washington, D.C. a few years ago. One of them was a hijabi who has vocally supported the LGBTQ movement. Um, obviously, we know these are completely at odds. We see that theoretically it's at odd, and we see that in its practice, it's at odds with Islam. You look at the Red Pill movement, they might make some sound empirical judgments on you know female nature or male nature but then the prescriptions around what you should do with that knowledge is where a lot of nonsense occurs outright haram is prescribed hey you should you should as a man who uh, you should learn game so you can game as many women using these tactics that empirically they work to attract women okay. but you should use these tactics instead of in marriage you should use them uh, to get zina as many times as you can for, from as many women as you can. And so they're, they've taken an empirical ruling or sorry, an empirical judgment, and they've mixed it with a moral prescription that is haram. Right. Whereas we Muslims can say, well, OK, is this actually firstly, let me verify if their claim that it's even empirically sound. Let me see if that's true, because there's a lot of frauds out there saying that things work when they don't actually work. So let me see if, if it's true. If it's true that X, Y, Z works. Can I, as a Muslim, practice this in any capacity? Does the law allow me to practice it in any, the sacred law, does it allow me to practice it in any capacity? And I see that, well, let's say uh, Coach, you know, Coach uh, Andrew, he, he teaches game and his, his book on game has actual benefit in attracting a woman. Okay, can I use this in marriage? And that's a question to explore. Does it involve violating the Sharia in terms of my, my, my wife's rights? Am I doing something haram in marriage? And we so we can look at that. The fifth. And, and so you know, one, 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 one sorry, sorry go uh, ahead. to cut you off, but one one interesting thing is when you see the feminists, like the more feminists they are, you they're usually more alone, right? They're single, yes. and um, the same kind of goes for red pill. The more uh, red pill someone is, you just see that uh, you rarely see a red pill person who is. Like a family man and he you know he has a stable relationship of 20 30 years it's more like somebody who's you know uh like you just mentioned just gaming woman and and right. it's very materialistic you know right, um right. so both ways it seems I that think, they're uh, up <clears throat> but if I get highlighted why that is because really they're just, just the prescription is just totally off right the prescription exactly. is just yeah. how to game and how to make the take advantage of the pleasure rather than you know, yeah. yeah it's pleasure seeking is hedonistic and there, there are red pill pioneers like Rolo Tomasi. He's known as the pioneer of red pill thought. He took a lot of even what even what he himself preaches in his books. He he's taken a lot from evolutionary theory, evolutionary psychology, and some of that stuff is legit, and and some of it's just speculative. Even from an empirical point of view, it's not all it's not all hundred percent you know guaranteed to be how human nature works it's there is a there is there's a lot of probability involved there's a lot of mm. sample size errors like there's you know a lot of what he's talking about is based on um post-feminist society liberal societies he might be able to make some accurate descriptions about how people behave under these conditions but to go from that to this is how human nature is in general that's a huge leap and so i in the green pill am trying to actually study uh, the works of Muslim theologians, philosophers, uh, the works of, of Sufi masters throughout history who talked about human nature more broadly and more universally and see where 
did the red pill actually fall short, even in terms of its description of human nature, not just its prescriptions, but its description, mm -hmm. because I, I do challenge some of its descriptions. And people like Rolo, they claimed in the past that they're not trying to prescribe anything. They say, I'm just describing physical reality, human nature. You do what you want with this. I'm not telling you to go fornicate. I'm not telling you not to get married. You decide. But more recently, he actually on Twitter wrote what is in no other terms understandable other than as prescriptions. They're prescriptions. He said, get a, a, a vasectomy. If you want to be a high value man, get a vasectomy. He wrote other things that were good, like, you know, be in shape work hard but things that he they, things that he that he included also uh were like ridiculous stuff such as getting a vasectomy and that's a prescription that's not a description and so people were saying hey didn't you always say that you're only giving descriptions you're only giving like practical you know or principles and you're not telling us what to do with them and so he kind of ran into a a, a dilemma there because he realized he contradicted his previous statements and so given these while the red pill, you can say, has some accurate descriptions of human nature, for example, it describes women as hypergamous uh, and it describes uh, men as polygynous. Those are accurate descriptions. How it interprets other aspects of human nature, like its theories, some of its theories on, on uh, ovulation, these things have limits. They're, they're not actually accepted by the scientific community at, at large. And we can we can dive into that at a later time. But the gist and the upshot is not only do not only are the are the descriptions of red pill open to be challenged, those in the red pill community who go further and they give you prescriptions, they're doing so from the same lens that feminism does, which is liberalism. And, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned, like, uh, for example, you mentioned about hypergamy, right? Right. I remember there was uh, there was there was a. A conversation between Muhammad Hijab and, and one other person, and uh, he Muhammad I think Hijab, Mahdi Tijani, right? Mahdi Tijani. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he he mentioned one one nice thing that you know even hypergamy, it's not something like you know mutlaq like just the, they're hypergamous, like they have a husband and then just any man who's like one rank ahead of them, it's just like yeah, no, uh, no. It, th there's also he mentioned like uh, I think hypogamy, right? Uh, uh, if if I remember correctly, but he mentioned that there are certain variables or certain things that if if those men don't line up on, they will never consider, no matter how much uh, how much higher they are in rank. For example, a Muslim woman, uh, you know, in, when she's looking for, let's say, when she's looking for marriage, if a non-Muslim man comes along, she will never consider it. It doesn't matter how rich she is, rich he is. So even hypergamy, it's uh, uh, within that. Yes, they are broadly speaking hypergamous, but even within that, there's nuance. There's nuance. I thought that was a very interesting point. Yeah. yeah. Well, I hope I hope uh, Muslim women refrain from this, and I think it's dependent on, for sure, their level of practice and the, of and the men around them, right? Of course, of course. Uh, I'll tell. I'll, I'll speak about the story that happened in my community on that note in a bit. But before you go to that, I just want to sure. highlight what you. I want to pick up on what you said there uh, right before uh, Hafiz Musa spoke. You said that the prescriptions that are being doled out by the red pill proponents come from the same foundation that feminism gives its prescriptions which is liberalism could you absolutely could you give some uh you know spare some words just on that idea sure sure so as i mentioned earlier if you look at the red pill manosphere currently the problem is it's very poorly quality controlled people will say there's no like orthodoxy there's no agreed upon uh, definitions apart from you know here's here, here are the the principles and the praxi and that's it how people interpret what to do with them that's that's up in the air but if you look at the culture that's been formed around it regardless of whether or not people like rollo say hey i'm not giving you any prescriptions there is a culture forming and that culture is united by certain themes just like the feminists are united by certain themes and that includes things like being largely anti-marriage right and i understand their concept of marriage is also a very westernized one that doesn't actually fit the Islamic model. And there might be grounds to be anti that sort of marriage where you have all these un-Islamic laws oppressing the man in the marriage and they feel like it's a, it's a, it's a way of, of self-castrating yourself. But a lot of them are not even open to the idea that you should at least have a sort of religious marriage. They don't think it's very important. 
they they don't think that um, they need to be subservient to a creed that they can instead judge all of the world by their red pill mantras. So they will go as far as, for instance, declaring men, metaphorically, as like God to women. And I've heard this from some of the more recent grifters. That, you know, a man is figuratively like a God to woman. Astaghfirullah. And so why does this happen? Well, for the same reasons. They are secularized and they, are, they have a liberal foundation where in their, in their, their personal autonomy and their desires are the most important thing to them. So they're going to use what they learn about gaming and success to maximize their personal pleasure. And that's how a lot of them actually live. And hypergamy, as you mentioned, you're right. It's not, uh, it's not a sort of absolute one size fits all uh, straight jacket. And even Rolo has a video where he says hypergamy is not a straight jacket. There's a lot more nuance, right? It really boils down to, do you as a man have authority in your relationship with your women folk? And authority has is of two kinds. There is what's known as positional authority. That is like you 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 have the title of being the, the sheriff. That's your official title. Or you have the title of being the husband. And then there's dispositional authority, which is you actually have the skill to establish mm -hmm. influence in your in your women folks' lives. You're socially skilled to actually be perceived as their authority. You know, the someone who has positional authority, but they don't have dispositional authority can only go so far, especially if they can't enforce it with laws, right? For example, a police officer still has the ability to enforce his authority with laws, but we can all tell the difference between a, a police officer who is, you know, confident and assertive and, and, and one who is like stuttering and he's, he's kind of like, his body language is very meek. You kind of like chuckle to yourself. He, this is the guy who pulled me over. That's kind of funny. He's nervous on the job. He doesn't command respect. He has a badge. That's the only reason I'm listening. But if he didn't have that badge, I know for a fact I wouldn't really feel respect. Whereas another, with or without the badge, you feel gravitated towards his presence. Oh, wow, mm -hmm. he's charismatic. He can set boundaries. His expectations are actually beneficial to my life. I should listen to him. He can actually enforce his expectations, his boundaries. There's a big difference between those two, right? Like and the so, difference between earning the respect and demanding it. Right, right. And and a lot of guys today, even in the Red Bull community, they want the position, but they, have, they haven't actually done the work of developing the social skills, or as Sidi Mustafa would say, the magnetism and the competence to wield it, right? And while it's true that the Sharia regards the husband as worthy of respect, as a command upon the wife, just by virtue of being the husband, it would be a lot easier for most women to respect their husbands if they had good social skills, right? And the modern world makes it hard on guys. They they grow up very socially isolated, playing video games all day. They are, you know, bullied uh, into a sort of silence if they express their masculine needs. Um, they're confused. The feminists will say, hey, you should be more vulnerable. But when they open up about their problems, they say, they'll, they'll be like, oh, you're being sexist and misogynistic. And the guys are like, well, you told me to be vulnerable. And what they realize is, no, you, you just want me to be, you want me to play a character, you know, that, that mm. placates to this fake nice guy. Mm. And I'm only allowed to be vulnerable by your terms and conditions, not authentically, not, not in relation to what Islam tells me I should be concerned about in my masculine development. And so when these guys grow into their 20s, it's not likely that they're going to be magnetic. Mm. You know, a lot of them are like, going through school, trying to memorize, trying to succeed in, in this conventional, very, very like post-British education system. And they never really learn the essence of manhood. They just see their dad at best working and bringing home resources, but they don't really understand what does it mean to be uh, a man? What does What is authority? Often their fathers don't actually have authority. I've seen so many cases where they might even be the breadwinner, but they're they're very passive aggressive men. They're they're not they don't command respect. Mm -hmm. They they actually get pushed around even by their their wives who might be stay at home wives. Then they lash out later because they get frustrated. They let it build. They didn't. Mm -hmm. They never learned. They themselves never learned how to proactively communicate with women from the onset. Like a leader, they learn to be reactionary, and so the boys grow up seeing this dynamic. So they don't really understand themselves. <laughs> well, how do I command respect? And then they're already feeling like if they're Muslims. 
they're already feeling marginalized in a, in a non-Muslim world. So there's like multiple dynamics going on that make them basically feel emasculated. And I guess I like, question, you said that um, the Red Pill doesn't do a lot or the founder of the Red Pill didn't do a lot of prescriptive sort of uh, or he said he wouldn't. Right. Um, and there's a sense where they do give the descriptions accurately, accurately or not, whatever, um, wherever that stands. But um, would you say that that's one of the reasons why the green pill you thought would is is really necessary because. On the one hand, you have some, I guess you can say facts, but then what you do with that, you know, in, in Islam, we do have this idea that Allah Ta'ala gave us rationality. He gave us, you know, the empirical faculties, but then on top of that, he gave us wahi to sort of guide us uh, further from there because, you know, rationality and these empirical faculties where we get the descriptions, uh, so to speak. Um, they can only go so far, but the prescriptions then come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, the green pill is trying to, I guess, you know, would you say that it's trying to fill, try to connect those two ideas together? That's exactly into the, uh, into right. the equation. Absolutely. My mission is all about synthesizing properly grounded, accurate empirical knowledge with the revealed sources and the commentaries of scholars, because I've, I've actually realized... A lot of scholars like Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, in his Adab al-Nikah, he wrote about things about female nature that were empirical too. Like they were very sharp in observing empirical facts as well. It's not like, and that makes me really surprised and it's, it's amazing. It makes me it makes me admire their intellect because it's not like they saw the level of degener degeneracy that we see today, mm. but they were able to still infer very accurate things about female nature. And... You know, a lot of people, if they were to read some of his writings and other scholars, including Sheikh Mustafa Sabri, rahimahullah, they would think that, whoa, these, these men actually understood female nature far better than modern red pillars. They were very and, observant. I, that's very true. Observant. When you read their scholars, I guess it comes from the idea of tadabur and tafakkur and really looking at the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were masters right. at that. I mean, it right. mu'min fa innahu yanzuru bi nuri Allah ta'ala. Right? Yes, um, and he's seen from, with the firas of Allah. Yes, yes, exactly. And I think the challenge is how do we take that knowledge and convert it into a transmittable format that can be modeled after and, and people can be trained on to embody it, to, to be reconditioned into a proper Muslim manhood. And that's where Green Pill comes in. It's about taking that knowledge, synthesizing it, the, the empirical knowledge, the revealed knowledge, uh, with, with correct inferential knowledge, and then converting it into a, 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 a process that is active, present, and that speaks to, to male nature and the male needs of the modern time and help them become men, actively mm -hmm. become men. Because there's conditioning that's required there. That's, that was supposed to be done in childhood yeah. by the father. And, and, and the other male fingers. But the fact that it wasn't done means there's a problem. So we have to try to not be a surrogate force to do, do corrective work, right? Help men build their frame as masculine Muslim men who know essentially one thing really well, which is to exercise their authority and to produce order in their relationships. And to exercise their authority, they need to understand how to tap into their Jamali beautiful range and their Jalali majestic range, which Sidi Mustafa talked about as well. And this is the essence of authority that has a Jamali and Jalali range. How do you effectively combine those as a man and exercise your authority to govern your relationships? Right? You're basically the Amir. How do you how do you learn to be an Amir? A lot of guys they don't know that, right? They've grown up on a steady diet of Homer Simpson like emasculation and <laughs> looking at passive aggressive models of reactive men. And, you know, I, this was something really strange to me. Cause I was like the boomer generation of immigrants. I thought that when I was growing up, they were the hallmarks of tradition. And I know a lot of them had to go through a lot of economic troubles and, and uh, some of their circumstances vary based on, you know, the kind of culture you're looking at or the place they moved to. But in Canada, a lot of the Bengalis that I've seen, they are usually white collars. Some of them are blue collar, but most of them are white collars. They're into higher education. And I realized that 
a lot of that, that boomer generation was actually uh, built off of post-British ideas of education, success. Mm. Just like in Turkey, you had the secularization of the Turk. You had forms of secularization happening in, in these types of communities. So I realized some of what the, the things that they've raised their children on aren't actually traditional. Like their own parents or great grandparents wouldn't have accepted those things, mm. but they do. And so there's like a bit of a break in the generation and it gets confusing because they'll say this is our tradition, you know, this is our way. But then you look into history and like, wait a second, this is your way after you took from the colonizer and your own grandpa in, in the 1800s would have been like, what is this? What are you doing? It just highlights the effects of uh, colonialism and how deep it actually went. Right. But uh, not to end on a... Uh on a bad note or on a negative note, but just to highlight for the viewers the importance of, I guess, swallowing the proverbial green pill, um, the effects, when we talk about the effects that it's having on our up, up and coming generations. And uh, I did indicate previously that you've run into a lot of situations and you actually mentioned that pre just recently you were dealing with, you know, when we were trying to have this, we were actually supposed to have this podcast earlier but at that time, you were kind of embroiled in this whole uh, situation that you said you were dealing with. Uh, and I think it's a, probably a good uh, case study or an example of where we can end up finding ourselves if we don't actually take that pill or, you know, we take uh, responsibility uh, of implementing Dean into our lives, into our social lives. May I mention two examples? Because I remember previously you asked me uh, for a practical example in a client's life. I can't oh, no, you're, yeah, yeah. Any it's as many as you want, actually. <laughs> I think it was related. The question was related to whether feminism has affected our communities. A practical yeah. example of how. So, um, in one of my clients' cases, it was appalling because he himself is a convert, and he got married at a very young age because he was craving a family. And he wanted like his in-laws to be like a like a sort of surrogate family for him after he converted because his parents kicked him out when mm -hmm. they found out he converted. And he was kicked out at a very young age. Uh, he converted secretly at age 14. And then he was, I think, I think he was somehow exposed at about 18 or so. His dad uh, was a very like staunch, radical Hindu, Hindufta type. So when he found out that his son converted, it was like, you know, the worst thing for him. It was like blasphemy for him. So he kicked him out. And this particular brother uh, connected with various imams who acted as like a sort of surrogate family for him. And they helped him find a sister to marry. And right from the onset, he noticed that when, when there were initial marriage talks, he was kind of like uh, emasculated. Not only did he not have a father and a family behind him, and not only was he kicked out early on, he didn't really receive that paternal training he was alone and so when he goes to the marriage negotiation talks he noticed that his uh in-laws were talking to the representative he brought and in their native tongue and they weren't talking to him there he was kind of in the corner as like a little boy mm. and he was kind of confused because it seemed like they were willing to go ahead with the talks but he it was it was like he himself was being ignored and when finally the father of his now father-in-law accepted him uh, for marriage, he he noted that from the very beginning of the marriage, there was almost like an agenda to control him, mm. to decide how the marriage is going to work, where are they going to live, how often do they have to visit their in-laws. And he found some disturbing content on his wife's phone. It was some, in, you know, certain, certain, certain interactions that should have been cut off. They, they weren't, you know, severe transgressions, but they were bad enough that there was a concern. And when he asked why this is the case, imams in the community, uh, his own father-in-law, and other extended family members, they gaslit him and they basically told him, you shouldn't be upset. And this was after the marriage? It was after the marriage. After, okay, so they and got married. He, he was confused. He's like, what do you mean? I shouldn't be upset. I have Ghaira. And they basically demeaned him saying, no, you have no right to be upset. You know, you should lower your voice. And he's like, what do you mean lower my voice? I'm just, I'm not screaming at the top of my lungs. My voice is animated, but I'm not, I'm not running around flailing an ax. I'm, a, I'm just expressing 
natural emotion and you expect me to be robotic. This problem escalated to the point where his wife left on the order of her father. She, he said, or, uh, so this would have been his father-in-law. He said, you, you know, I want my daughter back without any confirmation on his part. She left and weeks went by. He, he was uh, sent all kinds of messages from his in-laws saying, you need to get counseling. Uh, your, you know, your, your, your behavior is very concerning. And they set him up with a so-called counselor who's uh, allegedly an ustad. And that counselor said to him, you know, I'm concerned you, you show some very narcissistic traits. And then his, one of his, one of his sister-in-laws likewise messaged him saying, yeah, I read on a psychology today article that, you know, being too possessive is narcissistic. And he's like, what in the world is going on here? And he was very confused because he's, he's very young, early twenties, no family. So he's vulnerable. And he, he was quite underdeveloped in his own masculine frame. He didn't know how to stand up for himself. So he was kind of falling for the gaslighting thing. maybe I'm a problem. And he started telling this uh, so-called Ustad counselor, you know, uh, maybe, maybe, you know, you can help me. He was seeking guidance and the, and, and the, the counselor was gaslighting him further saying, look, you know, that you young men are the problem. You have to be very careful. Don't get so angry. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would he would mend his own shoes. You know that, right? And he's like, what what does that have to do with my situation? I cook. What? Why are you ta- Why are you telling me this? He never got a clear answer. I used and, to mend her shoes, huh? You know, <laughs> subhanallah. <laughs> and then he was. It got to a point where somehow the dynamic between this counselor and him it became so uh, castrating that he was seeking permission from the counselor on whether he can reach out to his wife. He said, should I message her now or later? And he said, not yet. And I'm thinking to myself, you are, you are now waiting on a, on a non mahram man to tell you whether you can talk to your wife. And the whole time, other people, people who are considered shuyukh in the community, they were having conversations with his wife behind his back and slandering him, giving her terrible advice. Uh, he, his wife fortunately recorded one of the conversations because she wasn't she 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 still had good instincts to her credit i think she was misled by the people around her um and she she had good instincts and she felt like something wasn't right so she recorded this conversation and he heard it and he was infuriated because the same sheikh i put that in quotes told him when he asked him did you speak to my wife he said oh it was just for a few minutes and it turned out to be an hour long conversation where he was validating um, only her side of the story and accusing my client of being, you know, inconsiderate or too controlling. And I'm thinking, bro, you're not too controlling. You're too permissive. That's the problem here. It's not that you're too controlling. It's that you're too meek. You're too afraid of setting boundaries and you wait and you build, let things build up. And then you lash out when they get to a boiling point. And these people are all gaslighting you and they are pushing you around. And that's the proof that you're too soft. If you were too controlling, they couldn't do this to you in the first place. This is the irony. If you were really this bad boy, macho guy, they would never be able to push you like this. And they are all doing it. And you're just taking it. And you're you're asking other men, can I speak to my wife? And other men are talking to her. And he was very lost and very concerned. And I, I just, I felt so bad for this brother because he didn't have any family. And he was let down. He was let down by people who were supposed to give him guidance. He would he would sometimes ask them about the fiqh and they would say things like, yeah, you know, there's fiqh, but sometimes you have to look at the spirit of the law. And he's like, what does that mean? Th- doesn't that apply to me too then as a husband? The spirit of the law doesn't also apply to me? And, and he never got any clear pointed answers and he didn't have the rhetoric skills to sort of bring that, that, uh, that out, that you guys are gaslighting me. You're not giving me clear answers. He didn't know how to speak to these to these conditions. He, he was too too dazed and confused uh, by the gaslighting. So I stepped in, alhamdulillah, and we worked together for about a year now. Alhamdulillah, these people are out of his life. His wife and him are on very good terms now. They are together. Uh, mm-hmm. Toxic influences that you know really tried to break this marriage. They have been removed from the equation. He has learned to take uh, his authority more seriously. And his wife has, has come to love and respect him a lot more. And she him, she herself was, it's very ironic. She herself was saying to him, you know, back then, you know, I realized that I was being misled by all these voices. And, you know, you you were really like, 
she was saying like you were really you really pushed around you were, you were being really like seriously whipped it was kind of shocking to her and now that she now when, when she thinks back she sees it herself and i'm thinking this is a really good case study you know you can if you write it out and really draw out all the lessons it touches a on of, a lot of different things you know and i right. think one of the one of the things that it touches on that we don't hear a lot about is a lot of the difficulties that new convert muslims face yeah uh period i mean we get a sense of that from this story here you know as a young boy coming into islam and dealing with what they're dealing with right um, right this is one of the angles that they have to deal with absolutely absolutely and subhanallah um i'm just really glad that his his case has, has evolved in this way i'm really happy I'm for him really, and his wife yeah, i'm happy to hear the beautiful really like uh had a ending. good ending at least yeah yeah it has, it has had a great ending yeah, alhamdulillah. Yeah, so. and you know it it kind of reflects what you asked me earlier but why do men need this training and his story was very indicative of why it was like we have this generation that's so disconnected from the traditional structures that would have inculcated masculinity in us that now you just need these surrogates we're, we're like in the belly of the beast living in this degenerate society so we are effectively trying to put on band-aids and trying to fight this this monster mm -hmm. you know and may allah protect us and, and let us hold out until uh, sayyidina mahdi radiallahu anhu arrives because i i feel like that's what we have to try to do like i don't know that's if we will have there, you know <laughs> yeah inshallah <laughs> what did you say I, sorry what's huh? that uh, your voice kind of broke off. What did you say? Oh, no, I was saying you just had to keep offering them the green pill, you know, band aids and pills, you know, <laughs> band aids and pills until we get to until we get out of this, this paradigm. Inshallah, right? inshallah, yeah, that's that's exactly it. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, that had a good ending. Is there a situation where it just seems to where the the pills and the band aids are, are it'll be too late for that, you know, or people should watch so, out for situations like that? critical moments you know yeah yeah subhanallah and a lot of people a lot of guys themselves they have a lot of feminist programming because they they have allergic reactions to what it what the green pill represents or if they were to read some of these traditional texts like uh, sheikh mustafa sabri's uh, views on womanhood the very fact that they have you know shame-based knee-jerk reactions is indicative of the fact that they themselves have feminist conditioning it's not just the sisters uh, they themselves have to undo this conditioning and they should they should do so honestly accepting that hey i grew up in these lands of course i'm going to have filth to clean we all have filth to clean that's a consequence of living in in dar al kufr etc right like we 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 have been warned by our our shuyukh that this is a consequence and it's not something we should beat ourselves over but we should be honest and mature and be be like okay i should understand this is a problem so let me get connected to the places that can help me and a lot of them resist that still until bad things happen. A lot of the clients who came to me were, were, were clients who were burnt in marriage. Um, back in my undergrad days, a lot of guys would avoid liking my comments on Facebook when I would challenge these things in the MSA because they would say things like, I want to get married. And I'm like, brother, the way you're going, you're not going to actually get a healthy marriage. You're going to actually become whipped in your marriage. You're not going to be happy. I'm trying to stop that from happening. 10 years later, they come to me and th that's exactly the case. They're in, in, in very you know, frustrating marriages and their wives aren't, aren't happy. They're, they resent them. And the husbands are, are, they feel frustrated chronically. They feel like they're doormats, ticking time bombs with anger boiling. They have no way of actually uh, dealing with the root of their problems. A lot of them think that I have to take on these unnatural, dysfunctional circumstances. Like, for example... I'm not allowed to comment on my my wife's improper hijab or, or or her decision to take it off. I can't say anything. I have to just bite my tongue. And so a lot of them live in this chronic frustration. A lot of them have dead bedrooms, lacking intimacy month after month. And then they turn to destructive habits like porn. And I'm like, it started with not liking my comments. And here you are. Did your method work? And the answer is no. And so I think that guys still need to wake up right now in 2024 i think a lot more have started um i think since covid a lot a lot of things have gone mainstream that has helped with that process but i think there's still more work to be done because the problem is a lot of them they don't think there's a need until it gets personal so they have to develop more foresight and be like i shouldn't have to wait until i'm in tens of thousands of dollars of debt 
because I'm fighting divorce custody battles. Or I realize. Right. Or in the case of one of my clients, he um, married a very, very toxic uh, uh, woman from a political party in Bangladesh. And she was being very ruthless with him. And he, he even moved her to Canada. And then she would say things like, I'll call the police or the smallest things like, can you bring me some water? Wow. After he had, you know, bought her like hundreds of dollars of Uber Eats. Or oh, if you don't, don't talk to me, <laughs> you know, it's like things, <laughs> things would escalate to that point. And they had eventually had a divorce and her, her side of the family demanded 300,000 Canadian dollars. And I was telling him, don't pay this. What are you doing? This is insanity. And he said, my parents are caving to it because we're afraid that because her, her family has political ties, they might hurt our relatives in, in Bangladesh. So like, wow. I don't, what's going to happen? And I'm like, this is insanity. This is, this is one of the worst cases I've ever heard in my life. How, yeah, how does this happen? You can't do anything. Is there a, is there a green pill for women? Like how, you know, cause women also have a lot of issues. Is there a sense of, you know, a special pill for them? I think that it's definitely something that's necessary. And I, I do hope that my, my uh, wife and sister-in-law uh, take it upon themselves with our, our directive to do something down the, the uh, down the, the road. But as of now, I've decided to focus on the men's work because I think that number one, that's the, that's the most uh, direct way to actually affect women without crossing any shoddy boundaries because I can actually work with men intimately. And those men can now deal with the women in their lives more effectively, like how my client turned things around in his marriage. Um, and number two, I think that female work, women's work, it has to take on a different form. And it's a form that will require um, healthy uh, sisterly bonds that are fused with female mentorship, but which are done in a very closed and small circles. Because I've noticed that a lot of larger circles mm. are, are prone for corruption, a lot of yes. corrupting mm. forces. Right. And so I think, you know, more intimate circles, one on one and, and, and good companionship and and really finding uh, a community of married women who have husbands who are green pilled and who are who are you know, sturdy and, and, and just and balanced uh, guardians of the family is the best bet for a lot of uh, sisters, because then they will be friends with wives who are themselves grounded in, in, in proper tradition. And so I think that. My, my goal is, inshallah, to produce like a green pilled community on a grassroots level where we can at mm -hmm. least bring in sisters who are still co coachable by virtue of, of the guys marrying them yeah. and then them forming good friendships mm -hmm. with our network of wives who are traditionally grounded. SubhanAllah, I think this point that you mentioned is, is very beautiful because you have a lot of people, they have this white, white knight syndrome and they just want to go out and, and save you know everybody and especially they would like to save the woman right oh, so wow. uh you know <laughs> so uh, what you mentioned this is something this uh, that we find in our uh our ulama our akabir you know the 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 elders with foresight you know the way they work with women is uh it's generally it, it doesn't mean that they don't work at all with women but generally the the approach is to work on the men and the men they uh focus on mending their families right the ma man being the patriarch um, and, right. and there's a lot more ihtiyat, like you mentioned, right? Uh, it's safer because we don't uh, we don't want to be in a situation where while trying to help someone out, we put ourselves in, you know, uh, you know, in a problem. We become the problem. Yeah, right. exactly. Right. So problem. mashallah, what you mentioned, there's a lot of foresight and wisdom uh, in that approach. And um, finally, uh, you know, you mentioned that there were two cases. Uh, right. What was the second case that uh, that you had mentioned? Can end the on second that case, Barakallahu Fikum, for, for bringing you back. Uh, the second case, it was what was uh, happening most recently, and it was uh, very stressful to deal with because uh, it involved my immediate Bengali community in Canada, a community that I had grown up in. I had seen a lot of the elders in it growing up. And I, while I had foreseen some of the problems that were emerging for some time, I was shocked by the, the, the reaction of the community. Um, maybe I shouldn't have been, maybe I should have, I, I should have predicted that people would have reacted this way, but it, it still, it still really, you know, made my gut wrench. And essentially what happened was 
we had a sister who uh, she grew up in this community since I think the age of four or five. And when she was around 12, she had the she had to experience the tragic loss of her mother due to health reasons. And it was very sudden. And ever since that happened, I noticed that her her father really struggled. I think he it, it hit him really hard because he has two daughters. Now he was he was tasked with raising them without a mother, without his wife. And he became uh, too permissive as a, as a coping mechanism, I think, as a compensation. Maybe he thought that this would be a way to uh, go easy on them after they, they suffered this loss. And while this girl was enrolled in like the, the typical, you know, the Desi Sunday Arabic class, there was like some Arab auntie that a lot of the Bengali girls were sent to to learn like how to read Arabic, learn some very basic I don't know if it was Salafi fiqh, but some 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 form of fiqh. It became clear to me that throughout her teens, she was straying. And the people around her, they were kind of passive about it. You know, they, other sisters who started wearing hijab to some degree, uh, they didn't really seem to pull her. They were kind of just going along with her, 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 her negative shifts, such as dating in high school. And they were too scared to advise her firmly. It got to a point where you fast forward to today, she's 23, and her family just announced that she was getting engaged to a Christian Indian. And I was kind of like, okay, I, I, I saw that coming in the sense that I know she was involved in haram relationships and she wasn't practicing, but I didn't think her father was going to just go out and publicly say, hey, everyone come and, and celebrate with us, celebrate what is effectively a celebration of zina, because there's no marriage that is possible between a Muslim girl and a, and a, a disbelieving man. A Muslim woman and a disbelieving man cannot get married unless the man converts. And I was thinking, okay, this is bad enough. But then what made things worse was the fact that people in the community, including community elders that are very close to me, they were one after the other folding. So there was no shahada at all, like not even a formal for a formality. It was just like just this is happening. This is happening. No mm -hmm. mention of he should convert. And I have on good testimony. Because a lot of times you'll see when this kind of situation happens, the girl's side <laughs> tells the guy, like, okay, just you know, just do this socially, and uh, then it's whatever, you know, live your life. Yeah, but yeah. And I, you know, that had happened a few times in the past. You know, those types of things happen in this community a few mm -hmm. times. But like like you said, at least there was a public pronouncement of the Shahada or there was the pretext that the guy converted. In this case, there was no such pretext. Yeah. Uh, this at, least sister, it gives, at least it gives, uh, you know, an excuse uh, yeah. to, the, to the people attending. But right. sorry, continue. Concerning is the elders you talked about. You said a lot of the elders just kind of gave they just Yeah, they just started to fold one after the other. Um with all and and it, it was nuts like my younger brother and i we were like losing sleep trying to stop people close to us from rational rationalizing why they should go to this we heard everything from we're gonna go there and we're going to give dawa we're gonna go there and oh you know the the actual wedding is in a year maybe we can still save them and i'm thinking wait you you are gonna go there thinking you're gonna save them but the event is illegitimate to begin with and i i consulted a friend who asked three muftis i even asked sidi mustafa and then and then we asked our local imam who is a muhaddid uh and all of them had the exact same feedback for, for one they were they, they they were they were uh repulsed that something like this could even happen and then they were very very clear that the only person who's allowed to go to such an event would have to number one be going there with firm conviction to actually refute the event and to have the capa the capability to express why it's wrong and to be able to defend the islamic rulings if challenged and then mm -hmm. they would have to leave so basically someone who's not perceived as a you're going there as a guest to celebrate you're perceived as Oh, this guy is coming here to crush this. Yeah, this yeah, yeah. As, a, right? as a threat to the party, yeah. <laughs> as a threat to the party. Even if, and, you know, you you could try to be polite as much as you can, but you, you wouldn't be able to mince your words. You'd have to invite the, the disbeliever to Islam. You have to tell the, the sister you cannot marry him until he converts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm thinking, are you, I asked these elders, are you going to do that? And, mm. and and one of them asked me to actually read their, their uh, letter because 
uh, not letter, their speech because the the fa the girl the 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 father of the girl requested this elder to open the night with a du'a and a speech, and I'm thinking, you're now mixing Islam into this. You're you're going to open this illegitimate event with a du'a, and I, I I asked that elder, can I read your 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 Dangerous. your statement then? Because he asked me, you know, he also asked me to edit it, so. He passed it to me. He said, you make what changes, whatever changes you think are needed. And he was kind of like prefacing it with, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to give those Christians a piece of my mm -hmm. mind. You know, I'm going to mention the Surah Al-Ikhlas. And yeah. I'm like, okay, let me read this. It's like, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Surah Al-Fatiha. Assalamu alaikum, guests, dear guests. It is an honor to be here for this wonderful occasion <laughs> to, to see this beautiful couple bonded for life. And I'm thinking to myself, this is not dawah. You are, you are mixing some surahs in there very slyly, and then you're event es essentially validating. You're legitimizing the entire event. You're legitimizing it. You're you're saying it's yeah. an honor, and you're saying that you were happy to see this this couple bonded for life when it's not a legitimate bond. And so, they asked me to give a demonstration. Okay, wh what would I say? And when I broke it down for them in English that this is how I would say it, their face kind of got pale. They're like, I was like, yeah, that's what I thought. You're not going to say that. <laughs> You're not going to be able to say that. And then they started, you know, coming with other excuses. Like, isn't this a, a, a form of bad other, aren't we, aren't we cutting ties in the community? Aren't, isn't this fitna? And I'm like, wow. Like the attachment to the community by all these men who are supposed to be community leaders it, it, it is, is ridiculously weak. It's 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 a strong attachment, but it's an indication of of ridiculous weakness in them, especially as as elders who always prided themselves as elders who could, you know, wield authority. I'm like, if you have such authority, why can't you give advice to this uncle? Right? Why can't you talk to him? And this uncle himself tried to, you know, I found it to be manipulative. I know his intentions were not malicious, but I found it manipulative because he said to these elders, "Oh, she's like your daughter. I'm like your younger brother." I'm like, he's inviting you to evil using such language because he himself is, you know, trying to seek validation for something that he shouldn't be doing, you know? And it's not like he's doing it privately. He's, he's asking everyone to join him in it, which is very, I found very disrespectful because it's one thing if you know your daughter's doing this evil act and you're not, you, you keep the community away from it. And it's another where you're telling everyone you should come and I'm going to now try to emotionally blackmail you if you don't. I'm going to try to make you feel bad. And I'm like, if he's your, if he says, as he, if, as he says, he's your younger brother and she is your daughter, then you can tell your younger brother, this is ridiculous. And you can tell your daughter, you're not doing this. And obviously the elders, they didn't heed that because it was all just niceties, formalities. And I said, you know, you should at least meet with the imam. If you don't believe me, uh, that this is not a legitimate form of dawah. Just like if there was a strip club that opened and someone said, Fahim, Come and recite Surah Al Fatiha to celebrate the opening of this strip club. That would be absolutely forbidden. If you don't believe me, go to the Imam. So the, this elder went to the Imam, and the Imam fortunately said, The two who advised you are correct. And not only is it wrong for you to go, it's also wrong for you not to advise others against it. Mm -hmm. You have to tell them not to go. If you are indeed a community leader, that becomes a fard upon you. And alhamdulillah, this elder didn't go, but others in the community went. Um, and what was shocking is the, the the majority were aunties. Some of their husbands didn't go, but they couldn't stop their wives. Their sons didn't go, but they can stop their sisters. And when we when people actually went to this event, just as I feared, it was it, it was completely celebratory. People brought money, gifts. They congratulated the illegitimate couple, and not a single person gave nasiha. Even people who prided themselves as practicing, wearing hijab, you know, they just got back from Umrah, they caved because no one wanted to go against the community. And it took just one girl doing something like this, marrying outside into a, 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 disbe a disbelieving home, for all of these men to fold, for their wives to go hysterical and, and, and coming up with justifications for going, some of them dragging their husbands, uh, dragging their daughters. And I thought to myself, subhanAllah, this is 
in front of my very eyes a case study of emasculation and the disasters of having the, the incorrect order in the family because who's going to then stop such degeneracy from taking place? Uh, you have this girl's father who is watching a, a disbelieving guy just take his daughter and he couldn't even tell him you have to convert. And I'm thinking like, I don't know any Muslim man with a, with a drop of Ghaira, just a drop, let alone you know, oceans of Ghaira who could just watch that happen and not say something. Sometimes it feels that like us hearing uh, people, people like us hearing this story from afar have more Ghaira than their own father or mother. It's, it's, it's just crazy. Like when you, when I hear this kind of stuff, like I feel a burning inside, like subhanAllah. SubhanAllah. And the, you know, the interesting thing is uh, the guy, he, he doesn't even seem like a, you know, very masculine guy himself. He's just very naive. Maybe he would have been open to coaching, masculine coaching. Maybe he, maybe he himself would find something in common with the men's movement. Maybe he'd be receptive to dawah, but like no one tried. Yeah. You know something? Yeah, I'm surprised nobody even tried to go and like just talk to the the, the boy himself. Like, right. bro, you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like Subhanallah, man, um, Subhanallah. What a Allah Taala give give them hidayah, inshallah. I mean, may Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala guide all of us. It's also um, kind of like Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala mentions about Bani Israel, right? Like how they were mal'oon, lo'in al-ladina kafaru min Bani Israel ala lisani Dawud wa Isa ibn Maryam. Dalika bima asaw wa kanu yatadun. That Allah mentions about Bani Israel that when they would see, um, you know, they would disobey, they would cross the, uh, the bounds. But also when the pious amongst them would see uh, the impious doing wrong things, um, they, wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't correct them. They wouldn't do Amr bil ma'ruf nahi al-munkar. I think it comes in a narration that uh, they would correct them, but then they would just mix with them. Like they would say, okay, this is not good, and then mix with them again. Because you have to be like a blocker sometimes, uh, for, you know, uh, for evil, uh, and and yeah, you have to take the uh, you have to swallow the bitter pill. Speaking of pills, uh, right, right. Yeah, when you're in a position of power, you literally have to stand up and say sometimes the unsavory things, and it's it's in the Sharia. For example, certain people like in Sharia it's mentioned that if somebody for example commits suicide or does something of that nature a heinous crime then the ulama should not attend his janazah or the people of authority should not attend his his janazah should be prayed he's a muslim but just to make sure the people maintain the seriousness of the crime that he committed in their hearts uh people should see that man the ulama didn't even come for his janazah subhanallah but here we have a case where it's being celebrated it's like on a whole nother level I remember even growing up, like uh, sometimes we would have like uh, relatives or family members who would have like mixed uh, weddings, right? Where uh, uh, there would not be, uh, there'll be inappropriate hijab and whatnot. And uh, my father would not even want me to recite Quran at those, even though those are legitimate uh, marriages. So if they request that, hey, recite Quran to open this. And there's a clear scene. It's like a, you know, you have men, women, and, you know, right. uh, not in hijab and, just mixing and inter intermingling. It's different if you have like, you know, they're segregated and whatnot. But yeah, in this yeah. kind of situation, we don't even want to, uh, you know, kind of give legitimacy to this kind of thing, much less, you know, so something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So that's part of culture has taken off. That's why recently I've, I've kind of stopped going to uh, uh, weddings, like in these halls and stuff. I told them, if you want to do the nikah, we'll come and I'll do the nikah beforehand somewhere. And don't ask me to come to... Because nobody follows, you know, mm. nowadays there's music. It's just all out now. And right, nobody's listening right. to what you have to say. So it's not good for us to be there. Subhanallah. And I think that this this inversion that's been taking place because of, of so many emasculated uh, men, uh, it has reached a point where it, they, they want you to join in on them, in on it with them. They want you to join in on it with them. Some of it, I believe, is because they, they, they might actually... Um, they might actually have a jealousy if they see that you have this sort of traditional marriage dynamic that they wish misery they had. Loves company. Right, misery loves company. And an example of this is like some of these older uncles, you know, one of them in particular, again, he, he prides himself as, as a sort of community leader. He was uh, suggesting that some of my women folk uh, be comfortable taking their niqab off in front of them. Oh, well, I'm like your father. And I'm like, I had to step in. I was quite quite irritated by that and i'm thinking to myself 
you actually said this and you said in my presence, I'm her husband. And you said that in front of me, you didn't ask me for permission. You didn't even look to me and I had to tell him off He's twice my age. I had to tell him off straight. And, and the same uncle was going to this event. He couldn't say no to this other uh, uncle who invited him to something completely haram, but he felt confident saying, oh, you know, you know it's okay. You don't have to wear niqab here. And so I realized they feel brave uh, acting on what is haram because that's popular. And they Why feel should shy we not feel brave, brave on haq? Right. They, they don't feel brave on, on haq. And yeah, it reminds of the call of Sayyidina Umar Allah Subhanallah. I heard one attributed to I think Imam Shafi uh takabur al mutakabir sadaqa that being like uh, uh, I don't know how authentic the arrogating the, to the arrogant one is like a sadaqa, yeah. Yeah, being arrogant right, with the right, arrogant right. person is like a sadaqa. So sometimes people they'll be quick to point out, you know, the uh, the lack of other, but they don't have uh they have not prioritized uh, what is uh, like basically the good deeds and, and bad deeds. So, subhanAllah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq. Ameen. 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 I guess Ameen. with that dua, inshallah, we can uh, bring the podcast, inshallah, to its close. If there's anything... Uh, our, if you want to mention how people can... Just, any last words or how people so, can get in touch with you or, you know, green pill, mm, anything you want to mention. Inshallah. Yeah. I have a... Facebook community. If you look up the green pill, you'll find it. You have to request membership. If you fill out all the questions, inshallah, you are guaranteed membership. This is only open to brothers. There are also two telegram channels that you can gain access to once you join the Facebook group. And finally, my website is under construction. It will be under www.thegreenpillcoach.com. Uh, I wanted the green pill, but unfortunately someone out there Allahu alam who has it for twenty thousand dollars. So <laughs> until that's lowered, I have to settle for the green pill coach, inshallah. And I have two programs offered to brothers currently, and a database that is offered and open to traditionally minded sisters who want to get married. Uh, you can contact uh, my wife and I if you want your bio data or your your marriage resume included in that database. And it would be basically shared within my network of green pilled, traditionally minded brothers. And you can contact me at becoming rijal at gmail.com. Becoming rijal at gmail.com. And rijal in this case has two A's R I J A A L. And this is at gmail.com. Uh, you just have to include in your um, title. What 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 is what is the purpose of the email? You can write uh, marriage bio data, and you can include whatever information you, your guardians uh, think are is pertinent to share, such as your name, or if you want to use a konya, you can use a konya. Include your father's name and your father's contact information and other other such details. As for the brothers, the two programs are becoming rijal, which is becoming men, and wife vetting mastery. And the, the brothers who I, I work with through these programs are the ones who I actually try to network with the sisters whose uh, marriage uh, resumes we, we, we enter to the database so that we can try to sort of streamline the process. And it's also motivation for the brothers to fulfill the programs and to actually become uh, rijal in practice. And Nothing these programs, me, like, like the idea of getting married. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you can get married if you're not married bismillah if you want a second wife you know and you fulfill the conditions bismillah um <clears throat> becoming rijal is a, is a holistic program and it runs for a year and so when you join it you get access to weekly live classes you get access to 50 plus hours of recorded modules that cover the the science uh, of uh, at the science and practice of becoming a man from the ground up we look at theoretical aspects and we look at practical aspects. We look at the physical dimensions of manhood through fitness and exercise, martial arts. And we also look at the social and spiritual aspects, such as developing charisma and good social skills, increasing your uh, communication abilities, learning to speak candidly instead of being monotone and suppressed, and developing good body language. And of course, spiritually, 
developing love and reverence for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the pinnacle and peak of, of manhood and of creation as your 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 trajectory to aim for to latch onto the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to always keep him as your focal point in whatever you do that that is transformative or otherwise and you also gain access to a community a private community of becoming men students and we do all kinds of events some of them are online some of them are in person so you get the the benefit of not just working with me but you get the benefit of working with your peers who include brothers who are married their fathers they may be scholars or or students of knowledge some of them are doctors some of them are experts in tech and or law some of them are farmers etc so you have a network of men who are competent in many areas of life and they can share their knowledge and wisdom with you to help you become a man capable of stewarding your family in these times helping them be educated on things related to health things related to their relationship with Allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and operating within the sharia and all the things that they do and for wife vetting mastery that's a shorter program it runs for about a month it's largely uh, access to pre-recorded modules and then you get four sessions with me in real time and at the end i actually try to help network you with marriage prospects and this one is something that i started more recently but it is it is ongoing and inshallah once uh, my website is up there will be two landing pages for registration for either of these programs and more information on their curriculum inshallah inshallah jazakumullah khair and uh, we encourage inshallah the viewers uh, to take interest inshallah and uh, find the green pill on facebook and inshallah hopefully when the website is up and also apply to the programs inshallah and take benefit from the experience that our uh, esteemed guest and coach uh, has to offer and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him tawfiq and uh, success inshallah and uh, with that we will close the podcast and see everyone inshallah for our next podcast wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh jazakum Allah khairan barakallahu